me once the church chocolate covered bacon. Have you ever had that? Mm. Oh, that's just evil. Right there, Heart attack never tasted so good, man. It was... I'm telling you, <laughs> what a way to go, right? Welcome back, everyone, to uh, our podcast. We are almost perfect. I almost messed up that introduction, but you, know, you never want it to be perfect because then that would mess up our whole premise here of being almost perfect, right? Mm -hmm. That's so, exactly uh, right. Man. That's exactly right. I am John. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm here with my good friend, Brad. Brad, how hey, are you? I am good, brothers. Good to see y'all, sisters. Everybody good. All right. What'd you do to the other two guys? Did you say something I, to them? Or I, I wore deodorant. I took a shower. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tom said he's out for today. We haven't heard from Wade. Uh, mm -hmm. Trust he had better things to do than to hang out with us. So here we uh, are. Definitely. But we're going to have a good time. We have something lighthearted to talk about. Uh, ah, there you go, right? <laughs> lighthearted, yeah. How was your weekend, Brad? It was good. It was really good. Had two baptisms and uh, we had a celebration between the two worship services saying, yay, we're almost back. It's good to be back in person and, and just having a good time again, fellowshipping. What does so, almost back for you guys look like right now? Um, you know, we're about 95 percent back with all of our, our midweek programming and stuff. Um, there's a couple things yet that we're still working on. Uh, all of that is still, we're still taking precautions. I mean, if you're, if you've got, if you're fully vaccinated and two weeks beyond that, uh, masks are optional and we still have some folks that want to wear a mask and we're going like, cool, do it. Right on. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't want to wear a mask and you're already vaccinated and you're beyond the two week thing, cool. We're, we're not going to, nobody's getting any, you know, upraised eyebrows about this or anything, but, uh, we're still social distancing as much as we possibly can. We're, you know, encouraging hand washing and, and uh, sanitizing, that kind of stuff. But um, we're meeting again, and we're we're meeting together again. We've got Sunday school classes now that are back in session. We've got Bible studies that are meeting in person again. And, uh, oh, everything. And it is, it's it's good. Uh, yeah. One group that we haven't yet gotten back yet, we're still waiting on the uh, organizer to get, it, uh, to get a hold of everybody and invite them back. But, uh, man, we are almost back. All right. Praise almost God. I am waiting, waiting, waiting to have a chance yeah. to do another baptism. I had, we did one during the pandemic. Uh, uh, and that was when we weren't meeting as an entire congregation. Um, so yeah. about, I guess, I don't know, the family was there and maybe a couple other people. There's like 10 people or so. While, you know, we did everything live. Uh -huh. The church was there. That was important to me for the church to be there. Yeah. But other than that, I can't wait to do a baptism. And I'm, Two little yeah. babies. It was wonderful. Amen. It was, it was great. Amen. We are a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I guess. I we had tape still up, kind of um, keeping uh, pews separated. You know, we took those mm -hmm. down. We're still asking everybody to wear masks just because it's kind of closed right. in. You have a pretty big space in your sanctuary, right? It's kind of oh, wide. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we don't have a problem with that. <laughs> you have more space than we do in that in that That's regard. Right. So we're asking people, you know, just still wear masks for a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. When we get done here, I'm going to go over there and we've had our, our hymnals put up forever. I think we'll take those out, yeah. you know, and people use mm -hmm. those for communion or for the hymns or yep. whatever, you know, again, things like that. So uh, I got a new uh, uh, dispenser. Uh, Gloria got one for free off of Amazon. I got one for 17 bucks, which is great because usually they're like 80, 90, over a hundred dollars. So anyway, we still Plus have refills. those out. Plus the yeah. refills. Yeah. So right. anyway, right. we're not, we're almost there. We're getting close. Yeah. We'll be there. We, we aren't really doing anything much beyond Sunday morning, um, mm -hmm. Sunday morning worship. So we'll see how, when I get back from vacation, I'm about to take a three week vacation, but let me tell you, I don't know that I have ever anticipated a vacation like the one I'm about to take now. I can testify. I'm about to go on it right after church Sunday morning. Yes, sir. And Soon it has nothing done. to do about with where I'm going. I don't, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have anything much. to do with the people, right? No, I, mean, I no, love no. the people. I'm just, I just need a break. <laughs> I'm just, yes, I'm just, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. anyway. Hey, t my Brad, have you ever uh, thought about what you want on your tombstone? Oh, my. You know, we just went through this with my dad. Um, and, and he said, I want this on my tombstone. And I said, what's this? And he said, he taught me. And, and he, he taught me. My father was, me. was, was a, 
he was an industrial engineer by trade, but he was a plant manager, a corporate, in, you know, a corporate CEO and all that stuff. And he loved the idea that he could teach people how to do new things and, and, and grow in management and such. And um, so that was his big thing. Is, and, and his favorite thing was Little League Baseball. He taught, coached Little League Baseball. Um, he played semi-pro uh, baseball when he was in high school and just out of high school. But uh, so for little league, that was his passion. He loved teaching little boys how to play baseball and and stuff. And so he taught me. We got that on his tombstone. Now, That's neat. but it's a it's a joint tombstone. It's it's like a I don't know how to describe it. It's it's uh, um, a stone that's flat on the ground, and uh, they're in a uh, he's in a a, a, a a plot that's actually too deep. So when my mother passes away, she'll be buried there nice. with him on sure. top of him. And so her name is right below that. And we talked and joked, my sister and I, uh, that we're going to put on there. No, he didn't, you know, when she dies. And so I haven't thought about my own tombstone, but the, the only thing I really want on my own tombstone is a circuit rider medallion. That's the big thing. So, uh, okay. But yeah. I don't, I don't have any idea what else I want on there besides name and full date and all that stuff. So. I can't remember who it was that said, you know, put on my tombstone construction complete. There you go. And I've there you thought, go. That's, that's kind of, yeah, that's right. Renovation complete or something that's like right. that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what I'll put on mine quite yet. I haven't gotten that far. But anyway, mm -hmm. so Kay, Kay, what was her last name? Anyway, Kay, she lived in Utah. She died a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Kay was a loving woman by all accounts and uh, very friendly, very outgoing. Everyone loved her. And she had a deal whenever she'd go out, you know, wherever there'd be company or parties, whatever she would bring her famous fudge. For everyone to enjoy so on her tombstone she passed away several years ago um mm -hmm. she shared her fudge with everybody by on her tombstone as i'm looking at a picture of it it's got the name of her children but then it's got big black uh granite piece k's fudge recipe <laughs> It's, it's great. Well, all right, then. Two squares of chocolate, two tablespoons of butter, melt on low heat, stir in one cup of milk, bring to boil, three cups of sugar, one tablespoon of vanilla, pinch of salt, cook to softball stage, pour on marble slab, cool, and beat and eat. Well, all right, then. There you and go. Wherever she goes, there's laughter. So uh, that's what she <laughs> they put on her tombstone. She want to be known. <laughs> Uh, by her fudge recipe and uh, how that go. recipe and how that that food brought a lot of joy, I, I suspect, to a lot of people. Um, someone wow. brought me once the church chocolate covered bacon. Have you ever had that? <gasps> oh, that's just evil inc incarnate right there, man. Heart attack never tasted so good, man. It was I'm telling you, <laughs> what a way to great. go, right? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So good for you, Kay. Thank you for sharing your recipe. That lives on. And I, actually, I'm looking at the picture. Somebody left a what are those olives? I can't really tell. I have to send it to you. It looks like olive. Uh, anyway, I don't know. Anyway, all right. So here's what we want to talk about today. Um, Brad, you you mentioned this. You brought us up, brought this up for us. And I think it's actually a good conversation. If you're listening, you may have heard something on the news or read something in the paper about the Catholic Church and mm -hmm. how there's a movement within the Catholic Church to deny communion to President Biden, right? And and members of Congress. And, and members of Congress, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. And the reason why they uh, want to do this is because President Biden and certain members of Congress then have um, a, a, a view on abortion that goes against the Catholic Church. Right. And essentially, they are pro-choice, right? That's what it comes down to. Yes. And so uh, there is, again, there's a movement to deny communion to them for violating church law, uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, going against what the church uh, says is, is, is important to them. Now, I, I don't want to get into the church law, you know, the Catholic church. I, I know, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that. It goes, you know, the golden goes so far about what I know. But Brad had a, a good um, idea that what this does help us do as you and I, Brad, United Methodist Christians, and those people who might be a part of our church, or even people who might be you know, kind of loosely associated with Wesleyan theology, 
this mm-hmm. does bring to attention our understanding of Holy Communion and certain practices that we have of it, because certain practices that we have kind of stand against, um, you know, this this idea that that the Catholic Church might uh, reject someone from taking Holy Communion. Right? What do we call that practice, Brad? It's an open table. Open table. Now, tell me, Pastor Brad, what do we mean by an open table? An open table stands for the uh, the idea that anyone can come and receive the sacrament of communion. And I I will say that, and I will say that with a cautionary asterisk, Uh that in our communion liturgy, there is a prayer of confession. And Uh the requirement is that we would confess our sins before God and one another. And having been cleansed of our sins through absolution, through the gift of God and Jesus Christ and how we forgive each other in our sins. You know, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then the congregation says it back to us as clergy uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And then we all praise God, glory to God for that because we forgive one another of our sins and sinfulness. We come to the table then forgiven and reconciled. So our table is open. You don't have to be a member of the local church in order to participate at the sacrament of communion. You don't need to be um, uh, in perfect, you know, harmony with all of nature and everything is the table is open. And and what Wesley believed about that was that it was a means of grace for God's grace to be parted out or imparted, uh, imputed, imparted to everyone. So to, to remember that and to honor that United Methodists, we don't hold communion back from anyone. You don't have to be of confirmation age. Um, you don't have to be a full member of the church. You really don't have to be baptized in order to receive it. But the table is open as a possibility for God's grace to reach everyone. Now, that's probably, I could do that a little bit differently if I had more notes in front of me, but that's basically how I understand that. That's it. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this week's podcast. We are done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Our really closing down hymn to, right? is, yeah. yeah. That's right. Benediction. <laughs> that's right. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, one of the things I was thinking then, you know, obviously, Open Table is part of who we are. It's part of our identity, right. really. Um, who mm-hmm. else practices Open Table? I, I mean, do you know? Yeah, you had asked me that. And I said that I think there's a couple other traditions to do that. And I, I really uh, am, am hesitant to name them because I'm not sure about them. Uh, I, I believe that um, there are certain traditions of the Episcopal Church that have an open table. Please don't hold me to that. I may be way off on that. Oh, I'm recording this, brother. We're gonna we're gonna hold you. <laughs> You're gonna hold you. Bring charge. Yeah, file charges and hold it. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, I really wish I could tell you who the other t- traditions I was, are. But, I was trying to do um, a quick Google search, and what I'm finding out is what are the best practices for dining at restaurants? Open table. <laughs> that's, not, that's not really what we're talking about here, Google. You have a reservation for two. Uh, uh, right here. <laughs> an open table survive, or is it losing popularity? I don't really think they're talking about the same thing we're no. talking about, right? Anyway, well, that'd be something we can look up later. Um, yeah. But uh, so, yeah, we have this idea. It's sort of ingrained in our identity as Wesleyan Christians about uh, being a means of grace open to everyone. So I think it'd be helpful then also, okay, so why do other traditions have closed communion? What, you know, what, what makes that an important aspect of understanding of their practice of communion, do you think? Well, because it is a sacrament, now I'm 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 going to tell you this is the gospel according to Brad. All right, this is this is I've read nobody that. else is doing that. Have you read that? Yeah. Uh, it was on the New York Times worst sellers list. Um, if you if you understand the idea of a sacrament being a sacred moment or a holy moment, a time where grace is is given uh, and experienced, then to truly understand. Uh, the sacrament in those terms means that one must be in right stead with God in order to partake. Um, but because Wesley viewed it as an opportunity for grace to to come about, grace does not wait for us to become perfect. All right? We, we don't have to get our hearts right with God and be totally clean and, and pure before God in order for us to come to approach the throne of grace. God meets us right where we are in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our sin and sinfulness. And then God cleanses us from within. And uh, 
you know, so to take the sacrament and just, you know, there's, there's this tendency of wanting to protect it uh, because of its sacredness, its holiness. Uh, we, we should not cast, you know, pearls before swine or swine before pearls either. And, and so we don't want to do anything wrong with the sacred moment and the, and the holy sacrament itself. And I get that. Um, but Wesley also believed that this was an opportunity for people to experience the grace of God right where they are. You don't have to get cleaned up in order to come to church and be a part of this, this table. Christ, Christ even served communion to Judas uh, and to Peter. And so, so that's a part of, uh, of the struggle with, with why some traditions have a closed church communion table, um, is that they want people to make sure that you know what's going on in this. I, I do want to do a footnote here real quick. Um, there was a time when John Wesley got himself in trouble <laughs> in, in the colony of Georgia when he was trying to um, establish a, a, a Methodist society, if you will, there in the, in the colony there around Savannah and actually around uh, uh, St. Simon's Island and such. And he had um, begun, uh, well, short, long story shorter is uh, he'd had a relationship uh, of friendship of, of uh, developing into something more than with a young lady named Sophie Hopke, who happened to be a constable's daughter. And when he would not offer her his or, or ask for her hand in marriage, she went elsewhere and became engaged and was married to a fellow who abused him or abused her. And when Wesley found out about it, he said, are you willing to repent of this sin? And uh, not that she had sinned to be abused, but that she was staying in the relationship. And that was, according to Wesley, some sort of sin. And, and I don't know if that's not a sin. I, I don't know what it is. But uh, he refused her communion. And that got him in a whole lot of heap of trouble with the constable uh, <laughs> over all of this. So even Wesley wasn't pure in all of this and all of his motives and teachings and such. Don't but it, he was just heartbroken. He was heartbroken. Yeah, Dad Gummit, you went me, you, you left me for this other dude, and he uh, beat you up, and that's just not right. So, so I'm not going to give you communion. No, yeah. I don't know what all happened to it, but um, I, I do know that that became a part of the reason why he left Georgia somewhat in the middle of the night and um, left on the first ship right? he could. Then, yeah, he yeah he left the, the the area and left the U.S. or the the colonies and went home. So if he ever comes back to Georgia, he better be careful because. Yeah, yeah, it's not good. That constable's still waiting on him. Got it, you know, leg irons and a whole bit. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this idea of close communion, um, and I, I, I think I understand it as well. You know, the, you use the word sacrament. It is it's a sacred act that, you know, that Christ gave to the church. It's also a, a, a meal amongst um, God's people that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that uh, that unites us, that mm -hmm. uh, reminds us of the sacrifice of Jesus, does all of these important things. And so to just flippantly, uh, in, in some regards, to just open that up to anybody, I guess would seem kind of um, not a good way to take care of it. And, and I think right. I, I get, I understand that, but I don't understand it enough to say, well, yeah, let's close it off. Um, because as a means of grace, again, another word you use, that's, you know, right. that's how we understand it. As a way that we can experience the grace of God, who am I to to withhold that from anyone, right? Um, right. Who am I to say that you are not worthy enough? I think that's the point, right? None of us are worthy. Or, or that I am more worthy to decide whether or not you're worthy. Sure. Yeah. You know? Put myself that's another in that issue. Position, right. Right. And so, and that's why <clears throat> the open table is so important. And I don't know the first time I really understood how important that was. This has been years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever I would do communion, um, I would go through the whole deal. You know, this is not a United Methodist table. This is a table of the Lord. And if you're here this morning, whether you are a member of this church or any other church, you're invited to come forward. All that's necessary is that you have a heart turned toward God, right? Something like mm -hmm. that. And I would say that every <clears throat> month, because, you know, Methodists only do it every month, right? Right. Yeah, 
I would love to start doing it every week, by the way. But uh, anyway, maybe after vacation. Anyway, and so I would do that every month. And I, and I forget, um, one Sunday, I had a young, she was younger. She came up to me and she almost had tears in her eyes and said, Pastor John, this is the first Sunday I took you up on that. I think she had been raised maybe Catholic. I don't, I'm not quite sure, but she was un, had had the understanding that this wasn't anything that she could do because she wasn't worthy enough. She hadn't right. been a member of this church yet. She had just been coming, and uh, those almost tears um, told me mm-hmm. that there was something happening in her heart that um, yeah. that obviously God was doing right, and so. I, I don't always, I don't know how you do it, Brad. I don't always use the full liturgy for communion. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'll, you know, just depends. I, I really kind of do it different ways. Sometimes I'll use the full liturgy. Sometimes I'll use the half liturgy. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll use the John liturgy, which incorporates yeah. a lot of the, you know, the, right. the sense of what's happening in there. Mm-hmm. But what I do not neglect to do is that invitation that whether right. Whether you belong to this church, whether you've even heard of this church before, who Mm -hmm. cares? All that matters is you've heard the gospel Mm -hmm. and have a heart that's turned toward God. And if that's that's your heart, then you are more than welcome to join us. And we'll let God take care of the rest. Right. 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 So uh, that becomes the important part um, of how we share communion. So um, that, again, that is a distinctive part of, of our theology and our practice. And so mm-hmm. anytime you go to United Methodist Church, probably any Wesleyan congregation, I assume, you're mm-hmm. bound to hear that spill about an open table. Right. It, it does uh, distinguish us from some of our other, other sisters and brothers in the faith. Uh, how have you uh, experienced uh, grace through communion, Brad, yourself? Oh, wow. Um, you know, we talk about being worthy and being unworthy. Um, I, I'm still astounded every time I stand in front of a congregation that God allows me to continue to do this. Um, that even who I am and what I do is is so profound uh, that I can't fully understand it. Uh, but that, but there I am doing that communion. So what's, uh, what's profound and well, let me give you an example. Uh, I was a student pastor at, in a little church in rural southwest Nebraska, and uh, I had just turned around. Our table was, was against the back wall, and so instead of having me stand behind the table facing the congregation, I had to turn around and get the elements, and I had just lifted the bread and blessed the bread, um, broke the bread in front of the congregation, and then turned around and grabbed the cup, and I lifted the cup up to give it, you know, give thanks to God for it and bless it, and I turned around with that cup, and here was a little four or five year old little girl uh, standing right in front of me, just smiling at me. And I, it startled me. And I thought, can I help you? Do you need something? And she says, I'm thirsty. And it's like, whoa. About that time, her mom comes running up the, you know, the center aisle to get her. She had no idea where she went. Afterwards, her mom said she turned around to me and she was this little girl was one of twins of that family and the youngest of the family. They had four kids. And, and she said she had told me that she was thirsty. And I thought she would just go out to the narthex and get a drink of water out of the water fountain. And they sat in the last pew of the church always. And so she, this little girl got up and went all the way down to the front of the church and stood there in front of me waiting to get a drink of Jesus. And I tell you what, that's a humbling experience when you have a little child that says, I'm thirsty. Um, and I wonder how many of us come to that table. I wonder how many times I come to that table, honestly, truly thirsty. It's, it's a powerful mim- image that's burned in my mind. That's been 30 years ago, mm. uh, but I'll never forget her. She was a sweet little girl. Yeah, that, that's uh, interesting because uh, my the first thought that came to my mind, memory that I have of the time I can um, think of communion being like, wow, just being impactful mm-hmm. it was my student appointment as well. Yep. And it was a small congregation and there were probably about, I don't know, maybe a dozen of us, maybe probably less, mm-hmm. maybe eight to 10 of us. And we actually went to uh, around the altar together as yeah. a group and stood in a circle. And, mm-hmm. you know, I gave communion to the person standing next to me and, and then that person gave communion to the next person and, you know, we right. went around the circle and then someone finally gave it to me. And 
I don't know, just watching it and, and listening to everybody else, you know, giving this, this invitation to one another. That was, it was so powerful. It was so simple. Yeah. yeah. You know, there was nothing else happening. It was just mm -hmm. this the shared experience that we knew that, you know, we, there was, there was, we were being united. I know that sounds right. corny and sounds churchy, but that was what, what was happening. Yep. That this fellowship was being I don't know, solidified, was being encouraged. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you want to say that, but something was happening there. That was, that was awesome. I'll just say it yeah. that it was, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah. Now, I, yeah. We have a family story. Uh, when I was uh, going to church before we got married, I started going to church because that's where the girl was. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> her, her, her mom, who was a pastor, uh, said, if that boy can follow you anywhere else, he can follow you to church. And so I'd go to church and, and every once in a while, I'd bring my, uh, one of my younger sisters. And I think she was maybe four or five at the time. And she heard the preacher talk about the body and blood of Jesus, eating the body and drinking the blood. She's like, I don't want to eat Jesus. Yeah. Blood. Right. Yeah. Blood. That's right. Uh -huh. All right. So, Brad, uh, open table. Mm -hmm. uh, how does open table not just define a, a practice that we have for communion? How does it sort of set the stage for what our ministry is or might be as well. Wow. Uh, I think the idea that that what happens and, and we even call it um, this holy mystery, you know, to, to really fully define what happens at the Lord's table uh, when Jesus broke bread and called it his body broken for us and poured wine and 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 called it his blood spilled for us um how that happens you know we can get into all the doctrinal stuff of that but you know when it really boils down to is it is a holy mystery this is god invading time and space and coming to us with this issue of grace that says i love you as you are but i have plans for you and I want you to grow in grace, in love, in truth, in mercy, in forgiveness. And so I think the communion is, is the big thing that we have as the church. That is, our, that is our primary service and ministry of the church is to, to offer this meal, which reminds everyone. I mean, if we're doing it right, now this, is, this is the kicker. If we're doing it right, people will realize what happened on the cross and the night before. And we'll realize that this was a great, great sacrifice of God in order to reunite us. That makes it holy. That makes it sacred. And it's a mystery in how all of that happened, but th there's no mystery in the fact that God loves us. And so as we partake of communion, and we do it regularly, or we're supposed to, at least Wesley said every time you, you, know, you meet together, you should have communion. Um, and, and to meet regularly and, and, and participate in this sacrament is a constant reminder. And I think that's why Jesus said, every time you do this, remember me. Um, that we're called to remember because this gift of grace was costly to God. And so it drives us in who we are to recognize that we have the potential uh, of reaching, reaching that God-given perfection only through God's grace, only through God's grace in Jesus Christ. And that's what drives us as ministry, uh, as as a ministry of the of the gospel in the world, to try to help the world to catch that grace. Yeah, if um, if I understand some of Wesley's understanding of you know what we call open table and his or his pressing desire to have communion all the time, because that's right. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he would take communion every day. If I yep. right, if I remember correctly. Yep points in the year or mm -hmm. and then certainly anytime the church got together he wanted you to have communion as well right um and, and i'm trying to remember exactly how it was you know of course some people say well if you do that then you know if you do it all the time then it loses its meaning and you know blah 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 but um yeah. uh, he didn't believe that and i don't believe that it loses me no. you let it lose its meaning right 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 so right. uh and I, and I think i'm trying to remember exactly but it feels like Part of uh, part of his understanding was uh, the reason why we would keep doing this. The reason why this would always be meaningful is because of this 
underlining sense of the Holy Spirit's movement. Mm -hmm. That because, that because the Holy Spirit was always at work within us, because the Holy Spirit was constantly, you know, forming us and fashioning our hearts, that, that it becomes a way, again, that we experience the, the grace of God, but that the Holy Spirit doesn't stop working. And so as long as, you know, you said it before, we do it right, right? Mm -hmm. That can mean mm -hmm. a whole lot of different things and probably doesn't mean a whole lot of other things too. Right. But uh, um, for Wesley, doing it right was, I forget how he said it, Brad. You, I think you're smarter than me, but something about, um, uh, I think he said self-examination, something like that, right? Absolutely. That's, and yeah. that's where the prayer of confession comes in, right? Absolutely, yep. That, that's what yep. doing it right essentially means. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, the reason why the open table uh, or excuse me, the, the way the open table, I think, helps us understand our ministry better is that reliance on the Holy Spirit, right? right. The reason why Wesley was so intent on uh, communion, commun communing, 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 mm -hmm. which one? Right. I like communing. That sounds better. I, we're Methodists. We make up words. We make up words. Go for it. Yeah. Com communing with God and with the church reason why mm -hmm. that's important because this underlining sense of the Holy Spirit's activity. And so today yeah. we have the same sense that however God is working through the sacraments, God is going to do that. We can't dictate mm -hmm. how it works and how we expect God uh, to do things. At the same time, as we receive those sacraments, then God prepares us to do whatever we're going to do. Right. And so uh, the fellowship, the forgiveness, the unity, the mm -hmm. power, all the things we experience at the table, the open table of God, prepares us then for how we experience the world and what we share with the world as well. Right. So that our invitation to the family of God is not limited. I read a comment. Oh, you should never read the comments, Brad. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I don't remember what the, um, what the post was about. Just the, the comment was something along the lines of, you know, about, um, uh, I think it, well, maybe it had to do with uh, like using modern worship because people are still arguing about that, which drives me nuts. And the mm -hmm. comment was something like, well, you, you know, you can use modern worship if you, if you want to preach to uneducated people and not educated people. And I thought, that's so stupid. And I don't say that yeah. lightly. That, that um, doesn't fly. Yeah. It, it really doesn't because that's, that's, that's not an open table sense of ministry. Right. When you're right. going to decide, no, 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 uh, this message belongs to a certain group of people who may or may not have certain qualifications. Right. As long as you're going to do that, you're going to say That's Christianity up. light. Well, exactly. And it's also, you know, we're talking a lot about John Wesley today. Um, I mean, that's that's what started his movement, right? That's what he right. saw the church doing, saying, no, 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 this message is for the people who come to church and these are the elites. And he said, no, I need to go to the coal mines. I need to go see right. the people who aren't coming here. And that's where this whole um, um, uh, movement, that's how it began. Be yeah. with the Holy Spirit's prompting. That's my point. And right. so how we experience the grace of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit in this open communion, I think, sets us up for how we share that open message with the world. This isn't for a mm -hmm. certain group of people. This is for all people because God desires all people to know that they are loved so right right uh what else brad do we, well, do we I, have a, I think the, we figured out you 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 touched on it really basically and i want to i want to just i want to i want to accentuate it underline it underscore it, whatever you want to call it that when we take communion the holy spirit is is the active participant in that yeah. we're the receiver of it but the holy spirit is the actor in that and the holy spirit uses the sacrament of communion as a means of grace the holy spirit uses that as the starting point or a starting point or maybe another point along the line of how we are becoming uh, transformed by the grace of god and that's what gives us that power to go out into the world and and preach and teach and heal and love and show mercy and grace and love to everyone so yeah. it's that transformative power in the in the table that is just that's that holy mystery. And I, I just, I draw on that all the time whenever I come to the table. I don't deserve it, but none of us do. But that's the gift of grace that God gives us is Amen. that whether we deserve it or not, it's irrelevant. So, And I don't know how you do it, but that's why I appreciate, you know, um, the practice of, 
know, when you go to get communion, you don't go and get communion. You don't no, go. No, no, no. You receive. Bread. You let someone yes. give you and right. you receive because right. there it is. You're receiving what the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. is, is, is. That's right. And uh, there's something powerful about that. Right. Something that, you know, gets kind of lost when you have to use a little prepackaged stuff that we've been using yeah. for a while. You know, it's just not right. the same. I found out, I realized that, you know, I'm doing the whole communion deal and we've passed those out. And I've said, all right, guys, tear it open. It's the body of Christ and tear open the next one, the blood of Christ. And people are still trying to open up the blood. Okay. <laughs> it's so hard to open that little plastic stuff. The beginning of this past month, you know, June, or when, when we started, I could not get that silly thing open. I'm sitting there, I'm about ready to get my pocket knife out. I'm going to start carving away on it. And, and my, my choir director said, here, I've got mine open. <laughs> Thank you. So all that to say <laughs> that... Um, I think God has a sense of humor in all of this. God does. God has to. <laughs> yeah. But like, God gave that to us, so... Yeah. But all that to say... All the ways that we experience the grace of God, all the ways that the Holy Spirit moves through communion, who are we to deny someone the chance? Um, right. Maybe they are backwards. Maybe they've got some wrong beliefs. Maybe there is something that they're doing that's wrong. But, you know, how, how are they ever going to experience the grace of God if we don't make room, if we don't help them see that? And mm-hmm. so, mm-hmm. Um, so that's our stance. That's that's the company line, but it's also I don't know. I think there's freedom in that that yeah. we're that we're open to to see the the movement of God in a way that maybe we don't see otherwise. Yeah. So and uh, yeah, we quote our our brother in, in Christ, Martin Luther, and say, "Here we stand, and we can do no other." Amen yeah. to that. All right. Well, Brad, who needs Tom or who needs Wade? I mean, truly. Who? Who? <laughs> We hope they're back soon. Actually, we won't be back for a couple of weeks. You're going on vacation. That's right. I'm going on vacation. Yep. And whenever I'm gone, nobody likes to run the equipment around here. So I don't think we'll be recording. So yep. um, we'll be off for a few weeks, but to, we will be back. Don't you worry because yep. we have to. Actually, you know what? I was looking today. I wrote it down. This is episode number 39. Whoa. 39. So the next one would be number 40. So um, yep. we're almost getting there. So, all right, Brad, any uh, final thoughts? Well, stay true, stay good, stay holy. Keep coming, taking communion, because we wow. all need it. Amen. Yeah. I, I really believe that, you know, once yep. uh kind of get back into practice, more people come, I think I'm going to figure out how to do communion every week in some, mm-hmm. some regard, where it's a separate time that, you know, people can come to or, or what. I just, yeah. I don't know. I think we need it. Anyway, all right. So uh, thank yeah. you, everyone, for listening. Hope that's been helpful. If you are a part yeah. of United Methodist congregation and you kind of wondered what that means, what that spill means when your preacher talks about open table, well, there you go. And now you hopefully you see how important that is to our theology and our practice of ministry as well. Thanks for tuning in. If you ever have a question that you want to, want to find a Christ-centered response to, let us know. We can do our best to figure it out. That's why we got Brad. He's the smart one. I'm the good-looking one. <laughs> yeah he is yep yeah, yep yeah 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 absolutely brad always appreciate your time have a good rest of the week enjoy your vacation brother yeah you too you too get away and relax man get yes away and relax. turn off the phone and oh it's gonna be great yeah. it's gonna be great i'm gonna sleep in and- <laughs> that's right that's yeah. right all right everybody have a great rest of the week and god be with you god bless